Welcome to the Be What You Want podcast. My name is Chris Hall, your host, and today I've got Dr. Paul White with me. Now, Dr. Paul White is a psychologist that's worked with businesses, government agencies, nonprofits, and also families and leaders across the world for 20 years. He's lectured around the world and spoken at the Milken Institute, Princeton University, Dartmouth University, and multinationals such as Microsoft. He's the co-author of three books, including The Five, Lo- the Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace, um, he, which is a, a New York Times bestseller. He's worked with Dr. Gary Chapman, um, which we're going to talk about the link with today, who's the author of The Five Love Languages, and it's one of his latest books is called The Vibrant Workplace. So um, today, I'm going to connect with Dr. Paul White about how we can appreciate, appreciate each other within the workplace and professional context, and also you know, what his perspective is on psychology and life, et cetera. So Dr. Paul White, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. So um, I guess out of full transparency, one of the ways that I found out about your work was because originally when I met my wife a few years ago, I read the five love languages. Um, right. And I know that that was a foundational work that led you into co-authoring this work that you do now um, with Dr. Gary Chapman. Um, just so we can lay some of the foundational work about what we're going to talk about in the professional context and appreciation. Um, for those that haven't read Gary Chapman's um, The Five Love Languages, could you give your take on a bit of an overview on, about what that is in the personal context? Sure, sure. So uh, Dr. Chapman is a, a marriage counselor and um, for uh, I think at least 10 years he took notes in couples counseling on when people would describe uh, when they felt loved and when they didn't. And then he went back through the notes and sort of gathered these up. And so uh, it's empirically based, but in a different way than, you know, traditional group research. So the the five love languages are, first of all, uh, words of affirmation. So it's ways to affirm the other person through words. And it could be oral, it could be written. Um, And it's not just, I love you, but I mean, it's, I mean, it can be that, but it's helpful to be more specific, you know, and to be able to say, boy, I, I really feel cared for when you do, you know, uh, whatever it might be, when you hold my hand or when, you know, you smile at me. And uh, so just using words to do it, and it's, uh, it's very common, obviously. Um, acts of service is another one. Uh, and acts of service is an interesting one in that um, it's doing something that, the other person would like done and uh, and just to show that you know it's important to them and and you care about them and one of the powerful things about acts of service in personal relationships especially is to know and do those things without being asked right mm-hmm. uh, uh, and so uh, I know my brother's wife uh, her language is acts of service and she just smiles and her eyes just glitter when he you know will do a project for her or take out the trash regularly without, you know, uh, being asked. So that's uh, the second language. Quality time is the third one. And uh, quality time is uh, interesting when we'll compare it uh, in the workplace, but in personal relationships, it's really focused attention. I mean, it's that you're there present with the other person. They have your full attention um, and that um, you are there listening to them um, preferably not talking about yourself necessarily unless asked um, and, you know, nodding and, and uh, sort of, uh, you know, doing some kind of verbal response to let them know that you're there and listening with them. And so, uh, and a key part about it is not having other distractions. You're not, you know, watching the TV over their shoulder and that kind of thing. So um, the fourth one is tangible gifts and tangible gifts um, in personal relationships. Sometimes it can be an expensive gift for a lot of people. It's not about the expense. It's more about uh, the thought and the effort and sort of paying attention to what they want or what they've sort of said that would be helpful to them and uh, going out of your way to do it. And interestingly, that uh, gifts are, we're finding to be um, especially impactful when they're not expected, right? So, you know, a birthday, Christmas, Valentine's Day, uh, you know, you sort of expect it, but if you really want to get some points for it, you know, you give it in, a, in an offbeat time. And then the last one is uh, physical touch. And it's not necessarily sexual touch. It's just that being there with them and people just like that affirmation of holding hands or having your arm around them or sitting close next uh, to one another. My wife likes to just sit next to me on the couch and as we're watching a movie or whatever. So uh, for some people, um, 
you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And, and the, the underlying theme of, of both the five love languages in personal relationships and the five languages of appreciation in the workplace is that not everybody feels loved or appreciated in the same way. And we can expend a lot of time and energy doing what we think, uh, you know, is communicating love, but it's really not hitting the mark to the recipient. Exactly right. And that, that was the, it's the combination of those two factors, isn't it? Knowing what one's love language is, um, especially in terms of how you like to receive love yourself, and then being able to almost speak French or Italian to your, to your you know, in the love language term to your partner, especially because, you know, their way that they receive can be different. So for me, the, when I met my now wife, it was transformative for us at the beginning of our relationship because I realized that I was number one affirmation, uh, words of affirmation, which meant that indeed the verbal recognition of like, you did a really good job on this today or like, wow, look what you just achieved, like just literally verbalizing one's achievements or acknowledgements um, in all sorts of realms. And for my wife, it's quality time. And I think in the personal realm, it's fascinating because when we don't speak the language, we can go into almost cliche scenarios of um, here's a classic, um, not a cliche. It's like, it's just maybe as a real kind of thing that can really happen in, in marriage. Right. Um, uh, in, a, in a classic situation, it might be one partner goes out to work and does so much for the family, should we say, in their mind, in their, in their attitude, etc. I'm doing this for us. And then they right. come home. They have not been spending the quality time with the partner. And that's their partner's love language. And the partner, right. therefore, does not want to give them the words of affirmation because they've effectively been driven apart by not giving them the quality time. And then guess mm -hmm. what it does to the other person that's been slaving away all day? You know, they come back and they go, I've done all of this for us and I don't even get any acknowledgement. So literally by, by speaking each other's languages as well as knowing it, right? That's the thing where we just know to straight away get to the point about giving each other what we need. Um, right. Yeah. So it's brilliant. Right? So, so it blew me away on the personal level. And, you know, as well as working personal development myself, I also work with corporates and, and universities and institutions. And, and this is where you come in, sir, because it's what you've done, which I think is brilliant. Is you say, well, look, this is such a valuable concept. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in the workplace, we might not use the language of love, literally, because it might be whatever that is, whether it's inappropriate or just not culturalized. Um, we might use other words such as appreciation. So right. can you tell us about how this journey began for you in terms of translating this personal subject matter into a professional one? Sure. So uh, my wife and I also had been positively impacted by the five love languages. In fact, I would say it probably saved our marriage because hers is quality time and I just didn't get it for the longest time. I'm a slow learner. So, um, and so I was consulting with family owned businesses and dealing with the family issues that are intertwined with business. Um, and I was actually working with a father and son and I'm in a business succession plan. And I was talking to the dad who was the CEO and I said, you know, how's the plan going? He said, it's, it's going well. My son's stepping up. I think it's going to work. I walk across the hall to the son's office and I say, you know, how do you think it's going? And he said, this is a disaster. It's never going to work. I can't do anything to please my dad. And so they were, you know, missing each other. And so I thought, I wonder if the five languages could work here. So I actually pursued Dr. Chapman for over a year. He had yeah. a very effective assistant who kept people away and finally got some time with him and uh, pitched the idea of working together. And given the fact that I'm a psychologist, but working in the business realm and uh, I have worked with family businesses and we just seem to sort of share similar worldviews. And so he uh, agreed for us to work together on the uh, uh, online assessment, which is what I sort of pitched him to, to do. And he said, I'm not really interested to go with that. So uh, we dialogued about it and really did sort of come up with it. Appreciation seemed to be the most equivalent kind of uh, concept of, you know, showing care and you know, positive feedback in the work setting. So, so we went with appreciation and then started to uh, translate, if you will, the, the five love languages into what actions those might look like in the workplace. And so that's what we did with the, the inventory and then uh, developed training materials and then started using it and then the book flowed from there. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, and I love that story about the, um, the succession plan with the father and son, because what that reminds me of is that the, the conversation is a two way street, um, especially in business. And that's therefore relevant to leadership, because leadership in the classical, almost military model, should we say, is just top down and py pyramid like. But engagement really does come from a conversation between two people. 
Sure. And I mean, in the family businesses, you know, the top down doesn't work well uh, when you're dealing with the family issues. And in fact, that creates a lot of problems where the, often traditionally the, the father or the CEO would be sort of telling top down messages. Um, and in fact, I would watch it with my, my father and my older brother who was working in the business and they would switch within the conversation from, you know, sort of owner CEO to manager to father son. And an owner can tell a manager what to do within you know, the work setting, but uh, a father telling an adult son what to do is a different dynamic and tends to not work well. So. Always amazing, isn't it? Because that, that, that then links to the psychology of roles, right? Because you've got the roles we have in our life. So the, we are ultimately the same person, but how we turn up to our partner, our colleague, our friends, even different friends, we kind of adopt these roles because we think about how we can fulfill certain expectations that we have with that person, don't we? And that is, you know, that's one of the, the, um, the relational roles that we can sometimes subconsciously adopt with people. So yeah, that's fascinating to see that in the succession of the family business specifically, very interesting right. niche or niche um, in the States, right? Basically, yeah, you've got the switching between the roles with the same person. That, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the twist to that tale, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Mm. And if you don't pay attention to, uh, you know, because communication patterns differ between businesses and families, right? So yes. businesses are top down. Families tend to be, you know, more spread. And, you know, if you want to know what's going on with the family, yes, the matriarch. I mean, because she's the one that knows what's going on with the grandkids and so forth. So you, it's interesting in business succession and wealth transfer plan mm. planning, you have to pay attention to both sets of communication. You really do. And that's the, um, the guy did a, I did a little short video doing a, uh, the metaphor that are, that leaders are gardeners. And so what that means is that they're fostering the development of the people underneath them. So of course mm -hmm. it's relevant in family business and succession planning. It's also relevant in, in classical corporate structures because, um, you know, I'll make a reference here to one of the Gallup, um, polls where they've shown that 70% of engagement is driven um, by how much the leader actively engages in the right way with mm -hmm. the people that are on their team, right? So mm -hmm. indeed, knowing the appreciation language is, is the way to do it. And like, for example, in my work, I do that through a lens of strength, which is the talent aspect, because I work with sure. strengths. Um, but this is also, this is the, this is something that goes outside of that. And it's, it's, this is such an important, they're all such important ways to empower leaders ultimately, aren't they? Yeah, and, and you know, uh, appreciation for team members to feel valued and appreciated is Gallup showed is one of the, the top twelve aspects for improving engagement, and it's towards the top actually. Yep. Um, and so uh, it 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 follows very nicely with the strengths uh, as well as you know the communication. And I think um, sort of back to the five love languages, mm. the the issue of perspective taking, being able to see situations and uh, the relationship from someone else's point of view. Yeah, exactly right. And um, I'd like to kind of, since we kind of you know, talked about Gallup there and, and, and you've got all the research you've done into this book, can we, can we tap into the science of this a little bit? Like it, on, the, on the personal level, whether it be my friends, my family, my wife, I think we all get it. Like we all get it. And, and I know this intuitively too, because I, I do similar work, right? But in the workplace, what, what's the science that's, you know, behind how it just tells us why important this is, in, why, why this is so important in the workplace. What's the science say? <laughs> well, uh, so the, the, our book, The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace, came out in 2011 originally. Okay. And then I just revised it and it came out in January of this year. Totally revised the research aspects, have okay. over 50 research citations in there showing the business case for yes. appreciation. And, and it's, I mean, you have to, to be honest, you have to be an idiot not to get it. I mean, because, yeah. either, or you just don't want to, uh, because historically I think people have thought, oh, you know, I don't really care, care how my people feel. I want to get the work done and, you know, I don't, I'm not here to make them happy. And that's true. You know, um, I think so there's some misguided efforts to just try to make everything rosy. Okay. Uh, the yeah. fact is, is that people do want to feel valued. Yep. And, and I think it's reasonable. Yeah, we, we have to motivate ourselves. But at some point, you'd like to know that somebody values what you do and the contributions you make. Mm -hmm. And that most people don't. 65% uh, mm -hmm. of the people, employees say they haven't heard anything positive in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when people don't feel valued, bad things happen. I mean, we know that 79% uh, of the people who leave voluntarily 
uh, leave a job voluntarily cite a lack of appreciation was the key reasons for leaving. And most managers and business leaders think people leave for more money. And that's, we got loads of research to show that's not true. In fact, uh, 88% of managers think that's the number one reason, whereas only uh, 12 to 14% of employees do. Now, it doesn't mean that money's not a part, mm -hmm. but leaving a job is, a, a, is an emotional task, right? You have to mm -hmm. disengage emotionally. You have to sort of figure out where you're doing and go. And it takes an emotional driver to really make it happen. So I think it's sort of the lack of appreciation is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And for us, you know, here in the States, you know, turnover is a huge issue currently because mm -hmm. it's hard to find replacements and it's the, the, the largest non-productive cost to a business or an organization. Yep. So Absolutely. not only, not only that, but you have absenteeism goes up, tardiness goes up, employee theft goes up, uh, more work-related accidents are reported when people don't feel valued. Uh, there's more staff conflict. Conversely, when people feel valued and appreciated, things get done. They follow rules and procedures. Um, good research that just came out showed that uh, the top companies that team members feel valued versus the bottom uh, are clearly more productive and also more profitable. Eight, I think productivity goes 18%. Profitability goes up 22%. Uh, so it's it, part of it is getting all that other junk out of the way of yes. dealing with people that are complaining about stupid little things that just eat up time and energy yep. that allow you to get the work done. Oh, absolutely. And I agree completely in the business world. We have to speak in the language of business case, because ultimately, um, if we're going to spend time, money, resources on introducing a training program you know, to, to do this or to get our staff to do the online test or to coach them, et cetera, um, they need to be spoken to in the terms of language of, of business case because ultimately yeah it's about what it what it costs me right now the cost is the what's the problem right now like you know it's costing you 10 grand to train every single employee every single time they learn leave right what if they didn't leave you know so that's the cost and then the and then the upside potential is productivity profitability engagement customer service woof, all these things and it's so right um and, and the reason we have to speak in business case is because businesses only exist if they make money right so that's, that's just simple yeah. A combination of yeah. work is about work we're not here just to have a good time right. but you know i tell people you know you can get things done and not treat people like dirt you know and things go better so yep. you know yep. it's a both and oh, right? oh I, I couldn't agree more i mean it, it's in, you know and this then links to the second point i want to make which is about engagement and then this thing this is validated by gallup right they've done they've done stuff across the states around the world um, in America in particular, it's a pandemic. Engagement is so low. Like it's something yeah, that's going down. It's going down in spite of 90% of all the companies and organizations have in some form of employee recognition program. They just absolutely are failing, right. uh, partly because they weren't designed to address engagement. They really were there. I mean, part of it was there for, you know, uh, years of service, but you know, a performance-based recognition mm -hmm. is, is very specific, yep. but it's not about helping the individual feel valued. And so they're trying to be used for a, you know, a purpose that they weren't designed. Do you know the problem with performance-based recognition? It only works for certain teams. Um, so what I mean by that is you might have a commission-based sales team, for example, or a, a CEO, directorship, leadership team, all these kind of like, whatever they are, they've got a particular function to drive, 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 achieve, achieve, achieve. And it's quite, I'll use a spiritual term here. It's yang. It's quite force driven. It's, it's whatever, right? Um, but there are so many valid functions within our entire business, whether that be operations, customer service, you know, HR, the, the holistic whole needs to fit together. And that's where this comes in. Sure. Um, and even for the sales team, even for the big hitters, it's like, you know, that will become a little soulless. And so we've got to bring some soulfulness to this through things like appreciation. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a key team member who was a national director of sales for a major corporation here. Yep. And, you know, he does our training with sales people and sales managers because, as he says, you know, a lot of people think sales uh, people are, are sort of coin operated, right? That you drop the coin and you get performance. He said, you know, they're people too. And, and I think that's the core message, a core message that we have is that uh, performance based recognition is okay but it's about performance right. and we believe that appreciation you can appreciate somebody for performance but it goes beyond that that we have value as people and uh and it also gives you a greater tool in that the top 10 or 15 percent of any organization are the ones who get recognized for performance and the same ones repeatedly 
you have your big middle group of 50 to 60 people, 60% who are doing a good job. They're solid. You're sort of your, you know, uh, solid team members. And if you don't appreciate them, they don't hear anything, yep. which then means that they're on the trading block to, you know, leave. And so uh, it, it just makes a lot of sense. I, again, I think performance-based recognition done in the right way and implemented correctly can be a nice tool, but it's, it's a both. And if you just focus on that, and if you just focus on appreciation without paying attention to getting the work done, that doesn't help as much either. Exactly right. Exactly right. In terms of, we're speaking about business case engagement, the workplace. Um, I think that there's a thread we're tapping into here, which is that this very much is from the employee or the team member's perspective. And it's therefore incumbent on the leaders to be able to know what that perspective is to bring out the best. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, and one of the things when I'm working with leaders or developing leaders, I say, if you're going to become a good leader, you have to learn how to lead people who are different than you. Okay. Yes. You may be good, you may be great, but if you only can deal with people like you, you have a bunch of little mini yous falling around, that's not a very effective team, all right? I mean, you have to have other kinds of skills and motivation, and so it's just critical. And, and, and again, the core concept is that not everybody feels appreciated in the same way. And for example, you know, a high-level salesperson or, uh, you know, uh, a, a financial uh, executive who's motivated by you know, either tangible gifts and rewards or sort of attention, um, we found that about 40 to 50% of all employees absolutely do not want attention. They don't want to go down in front for a big, you know. Isn't that recognition. fascinating? Yeah, they don't want to be in the limelight, right? Right, wow. right. Mm -hmm. And and yet the, the people who are designing, they say, wow, well, you know, we need to do this big thing. And I had one woman leader, she said, you know, I got employee of the year uh, award and, um, the night of the, the program, I spent the 15 to 20 minutes prior to getting the award in the bathroom throwing up. You know, <laughs> she was so nervous. And so, you know, and so in our training that we do, uh, the appreciation at work training, um, we um, help analyze that because there's different reasons why people don't want to go down front. I mean, it could be that, you know, they just don't like the focus. They're afraid they're going to trip. They don't want to have to say anything. There's lots of different reasons. And so you can manage some of that at least. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And it's so true because I, I have a problem with that because, not a problem, sorry. And I have a problem, I have a hard time understanding it, even though I do, because I'm such an extrovert. You know, so I'll stand on stage and speak to a thousand people. It's not a problem. Um, but, you know, lots of people in life, indeed, um, they, they would just die inside. You know, literally not even Right. Speak. I mean, I, I often, I'll, when I'm speaking, I'll uh, ask people, you know, how many don't want to go out front. And one of the issues is that another kind of group thing that we do here sometimes in the States is they'll have sort of like a family and friend day or party or appreciation kind of thing. And you invite people, they get to see, meet other people and all that. Well, for an introvert going to an unstructured social event with people they don't know very well, it's just like, kick me in the shins and let's get it over with because this is just painful. You know, and, and the party formers are going to say, oh, it's going to be fun. You'll have it. And they just say to themselves at least, no, it's not. Shut up. I want to get out of here. You know, just give me a give me a gift card for a book and let me go home. So uh, it's it's hard. I, to be honest, a challenge for us in the U.S. is uh, culturally we're not doing a good job with teaching young people, whether it's kids or young adults, uh, being able to see situations from other people's point of view. Okay. And it, it, it's creeping into relationships and workplaces. It's like, well, this is what I want. So, you know, why can't I have it? Or, you know, just not being able to see sort of the big picture, it's a challenge. Absolutely. And in the function of business, one of the things I try to encourage people in terms of their personal blossoming is that you don't need to be well-rounded and you shouldn't be well-rounded as an individual, but um, as well as seeing things from other people's point of view, it is important to recognize that the business overall does need to be well-rounded. And so again, that links to the, you know, seeing the other perspective thing there because, um, I truly believe and know from the statistics that we can re release our own inner Richard Branson and Steve Jobs if we just focus on what we're really good at. Um, mm -hmm. And that means not being well-rounded, actually. But then, yeah, as a business, we do need to be well-rounded. And that comes from appreciating other people's point of views, not taking the high road that it's my way or nothing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I find that um, we want to... 
sometimes we accept that they're different, but we want to tell them, but you should like this. You know, it, it's sort of like, I understand you're different, but if, if you were really, a, 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 you know, uh, good at this or, or mature, you know, you'd come my way. And we've got to just, you know, those of us have been married, I've been married 39 <laughs> years now. I mean, you, you sort of give up trying to change other people. You realize it's not going to work and yep. it's okay for them to be them. So totally, totally, totally. Yeah. Celebrating difference. is okay to be them. And also then linking it to business it's about the outcome, right? So what's great about business is similar to marriage. You know, the outcome of being in a marital relationship or friendship, et cetera, can be like the outcome is we want to get on and be in each other's lives. So let's make this work. So the outcome in business can be, we want to be successful in business in, via, via whatever metric is. So let's bring these different points of views. Let's bring these different types of appreciation together yeah. because we can agree that by doing so, that's the outcome. Yeah. And, and let me just speak to the issue that people often ask, you know, in a personal relationship, you, you can observe and see, and even talk about, you know, how would you like to be shown love? In the workplace, it's a different dynamic. I mean, uh, so often people say, well, how do you find out how somebody else wants to be appreciated? Well, there's some different things people have gone through. I mean, you can ask, you say, you know, if I want to show you appreciation, what do I do? Well, in our culture, that's a weird question. Right. <laughs> so it's just, you know, and you're not going to get much, right? You're going to get, I don't know, tell me thanks. And that's about all you get. So um, and, and then you go, well, okay, so can you watch them and observe what they do and see if that's their language? Well, the problem is there aren't that many data points where you get to observe somebody at work showing appreciation to somebody else. Yep. And secondly, research that we've found is that only about 75% of the time do people use the language that's important to them, especially with gifts. A lot of gift givers don't necessarily like gifts. They just like giving them. Yep. Um, and so you know, then what do you do? Well, one sort of workaround that we found that's partially there is to sort of ask when you're discouraged, what can someone do or what has someone done to encourage you? Because in my mind, appreciation is about things for the past, okay? And encouragement is present in the future. There's the same kind of actions. Um, um, and so they can work. Again, you're going to have sort of a, a narrow repertoire. So that's where, and it sounds a little self-serving, but to, to be honest, the, we've had 185,000 people take our Motivating by Appreciation inventory in nine languages. And uh, not just knowing the person's language really isn't sufficient uh, because uh, some people like private words, some people like it written, some people don't mind it in front of a team, some people don't mind it you know, in front of a large group. You got to get it right or it's going to create problems. The same thing with quality time in the workplace. Sometimes in the past, it was more about wanting time with your supervisor and manager and getting their ear or being able to share or learn more these days is more about colleagues and, and peers. And so in our inventory, not only do we identify the language, but also the specific actions that a person wants and from whom they want it, because you may want to get together and, you know, watch a rugby match this weekend, uh, you know, with your friends, but you're not going to invite your, your supervisor, right? And so being able to do that. And so, uh, and, and the cool thing about it is we can create a group report for a team so they can he see how each other wants to be shown appreciation and, and work at it. And the power that we found uh, is really a both and. Both people want to be valued and appreciated from their supervisor or manager, mm -hmm. but also their colleagues. Because who knows first when you're having a bad day, right? I mean, your, your colleague. And so being able to combine those uh, has been shown to be really quite powerful. That's fascinating. Okay. Um, in terms of the way that you do this inventory, 185,000 people, is it, is it something you do digitally? Is it online? Do you then do like yep. workshops and all yes. that? Stuff? Yep. So, um, so there's a code. Uh, if you buy a, a book, the five languages of appreciation in the workplace, there's a code in the back side cover that you go online to mbainventory.com you take it it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to take and uh, then it creates a, a pdf report right there that you can save and print but we also uh, you can just buy groups of codes for your team members because not everybody wants to read the book yep. and we also created different versions for different settings because the actions differ whether you work in a medical setting yep. or a school the military uh, government settings and even long distance or remote relationships because part of the issue is how, how do you show you know quality time appreciation through time or access service when you work in a different state or city and so we created different versions and 
so people can take that and, and go from there. That's really nicely um, customized and bespoke. I like that a lot. And that is the age that we live in now. You know, I can dial into a podcast with you from Australia all the way to the Midwest, you know, like, and here we are, you know, it's not a problem. It's very normal um, to, be, right. to be working like this nowadays. Um, let's talk about some of the problems in the workplace. Cause I know that, you know, you, one of your latest books is the vibrant workplace. Um, mm-hmm. I'll ask a potent question. Um, how does toxicity manifest in the work? place and whose responsibility is it to weed out that toxicity yeah so um a few years ago uh, as i was speaking and training on positive things people at breaks would and afterwards would come up and tell me nasty stories about how bad the workplace was or what a jerk their boss was so i wound up doing some research we have eighty-five thousand people on our newsletter list and we'll send out polls and we did that, and then I interviewed people and, and wrote a book on rising above a toxic workplace and then developed some online courses. What's interesting about toxic workplaces is, I mean, the, the starting points of, of a toxic workplace are in every workplace, right? I mean, it, it, it's an issue of degree and intensity. But um, I would say probably w- one of the hallmarks of uh, a toxic workplace is negativity, right? That people complain, grumble, gossip you know, just are moaning and groaning all over the place and never say anything. But we also found that really there were three key components to toxic workplaces. One is a sick system that we have some systems here in the States, hospitals, universities, that there's, they're just not designed well for accountability, for good communication, decision-making. And so, you know, it's sort of like if you have a building and it's not structurally sound, I don't care what, what you decorate it like, it's, it doesn't work well, right? So you have sick systems, you have toxic leaders, and they're not necessarily at the top of the organization. They can be, you know, a supervisor or director at different places. And they're different than incompetent leaders. Um, and I'd be glad, you know, if people want to write me or write you and we can get them a, a, um, an article linked to toxic leaders. But essentially, they're narcissistic. They're all about themselves, right? And, and as a result, you have to be careful around toxic leaders because they will take advantage of you. They will use you and throw you away and they don't give a rip about you except for as you help them reach their goals which are personal goals not they can mask as organization goals for a while but ultimately it's about them Um, and then the third component are uh, dysfunctional colleagues and we're all dysfunctional to some degree right but but you know the people that blame make excuses uh, aren't accountable they create conflict between other people if you have those three components you, you're moving towards a pretty toxic workplace now you asked who's responsible for yeah. dealing with it one uh, we just finished a five-part uh online individual tutorial course and one of the parts is your response because it, it, one of the mis understandings we have i think here in the states is we tend to think about culture as being external when actually we're part of it right i mean culture is the aggregate of hundreds and thousands of individual interactions and so the way it changes partly at least is through hundreds of thousands of individual interactions and so if i can change my interactions with the people that i work with that's a start now i don't have control usually over the whole thing but i can start there so like take negativity. How do you deal with the negative workplace? Well, we found two two key actions. One is don't add to the negativity, right? I mean, if people are groaning and complaining, don't pile on and say, oh yeah, and you had <laughs> more fuel to the fire. And secondly, and, and so part of that is you might just, you know, say, hey, I'll catch you all later. I mean, you don't have to call them out on it. You don't have to, you, but you just back off. And then the second part is to, do or say something positive. And it doesn't have to be in this appreciation sense about the person. We found that really a positive comment is sort of like throwing water on a smoldering fire that's once it gets going. And so you can just say, wow, well, isn't it a beautiful day today? Or did you did you see the sunset last night? Or, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm thankful that I work inside and I don't have to work outside anymore in the heat or cold or whatever. And just those two actions repeatedly in different settings can really make a difference. And so um, there are some things like the structural part of a sick system, you know, we may or may not be able to affect, but we can clearly, we we have a a responsibility to have some input. Having said that, especially around toxic leaders, you also, you have to take care of yourself. 
because the organization will survive. You know, I, I've worked for here in the States, you know, not for profit organizations with a mission and all that. And they'll eat you up if you like, it, and they'll drain you dry. At some point you have to, you have to sort of take care of yourself. So it's a, it's a both and, but ultimately, you know, I have, I have the ability to make a difference. Absolutely. I think that's so astute. I, I, I fully agree. Culture is made up of many transactions and how we respond is the responsibility of the individual. And the, the, the personal responsibility thing is fascinating. And even I agree with everything you just said. And then even with the, 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 the employee that might be, shall we say, classically disempowered um, because they've just got the one leader, the one manager, the one boss, and they are a jerk. Right. If I go against that person, boom, I'm the one that gets fired. Right. You know, and actually, to be to be quite candid with you, the states doesn't have much in terms of protecting the rights of employees in terms of um, employment law. Like in Australia and the UK, just for comparison, um, mm -hmm. you've got to be super careful about the way that you um, would what you would say is fire someone. It's not okay. you, we don't just get to fire people in Australia and the UK. And I'm not saying one's <laughs> right or wrong, but like seriously, the employee is protected, and that's great. Um, it's kudos. It's all about the performance. You know what happened, what didn't happen, the number of uh, warnings you gave, the meetings you had to discuss it. But my impression is that in the States, you're a bit more vulnerable in terms of like a boss can just go, boom, you're fired. You're yeah, it depends on the setting. I mean, for government and for state universities and so forth, I mean, they have far more protection. I okay. mean, it's yeah. sort of a bad rep about that you can't get rid of them even if you want. But uh, but in the private sector, that's that's true. I mean, there's still... There's some things you have to go through, but it, it's not so onerous. Well, but, but so coming back to the point about how we can re-empower employees, because, um, you know, I had a friend that went for a, you know, uh, a job interview and what he told me about was a fascinating thing where nowadays you can leave a review and this is the digital age. You can leave a review of the employer um, and you can say like, man, I left this place because they don't give a rat's ass about toxicity or whatever it is. Like, and, yeah. and you know, I say, power to the people there because i think it's important in this day and age we live in that we can um re-empower the employees i actually saw that just uh last night uh on um uh, uh clothing cleaners place that i was looking for the address and they had some ratings and there was this really long <laughs> negative review and but underneath it the uh owner stated this is not a customer this is a, a disgruntled employee so, I mean, you know, it can go both ways, but oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. But then I think that then links to, um, you know, if you think about, for example, yes, the organization will always survive, but, but you know, if you got, this is, this is a good thing about these types of reviews, because for example, if you go to, I want to go for Indian food tonight, right. And I read the reviews on Google. If it's got one, one star review, everyone's eyes go to the one star review. Um, as long as there's 20 million five-star reviews, then most of the time people go, okay, one person had a yeah. bad experience. But it's when it right, right. stacks up, right? It's when it stacks yeah. up. Um, mm -hmm. I really like the response. Yeah, I like the answer there. It's about culture. It's about response. It's about responsibility um, to the context there. Because, yeah, that we can do something about it. Now, I understand that you also specialize, as you've alluded to, in family uh, business coaching. Um, what are the types of, more, more broadly, what are the types of dynamics that you find you have to address in the family business coaching um, space that you know, fascinate you from a psychological point of view? Ah, fascinate or frustrate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you have to pay attention to the family dynamics. And I would say, I, so I've done this for 20 years. And actually, to be honest, I've backed off of that, uh, the family business stuff. Some, I still do a little bit. but. Um, businesses and families are different than they were 20 years ago here in the States. And so there's less sort of moral, ethical integrity, and also just crazy family dynamics that uh, make it really tough with lots of blended families and all this that it's just super complicated. The, the challenge is this, is that you have to think about, a family business is basically three systems. You have business ownership, who owns it and gets to decide what they're going to do with it. You have business management. So they may be delegated to from the owners and they sort of run it on day to day. And then you have the family. And usually those three circles intersect at some point and sometimes a total overlap where uh, everybody's sort of in the same circle. But over time you have more managers. They're not family members. You have family who's not part of the business. Well, when you, when you have boundary issues of people making decisions or wanting to make decisions about another system that they're really not part of, 
So like a daughter or a son, doesn't have to, doesn't matter, that wants to critique how their sibling is managing the company, even though they don't work for the company, that's a boundary violation, you know, and that's, you know, that's not your deal. <laughs> and so there's that part, but there's also the part of, at least here in the States, we have sort of the, um, historically, we've had the issue of family owned businesses often owned by a husband and wife together. And maybe they're over time, the wife uh, has become less involved in the business and the husband sort of running it and making decisions. But when you start to talk about wealth transfer to kids, which includes the business, mama is pretty interested in that. And you can't just sort of say, here, sign this paper. She's going to say, well, whoa, what about, you know, Jimmy or what about Susie, you know, and they don't work in the business. And so you have to really pay attention to the family relationships. And, and the, I think that one of the biggest challenges I see repeated, I just spoke to a big conference in California on this, that when you own something, you can do whatever you want with it. You, let's say if you own a car, right? You can take care of it. You can put it out in the desert and let it rot. You can give it away. You can ma maintain it. Same thing with a business. Um, and so you can use the business to help support the family. Uh, but that you typically is not healthy for the business because you're draining resources off, right? But if your parents or grandparents or whatever, if you want to support family members, you can do that, but you have to understand the cost of the business. That's here, that's usually the direction that goes. The, I've been in some situations where the business was all about the business and they fired people and treated people in the family crappy and it broke relationships, right? So you can do that from a business point of view, but it breaks the relationships. And so it, it's a, it's a, a tight rope to, to walk um, and it changes over time. It's not static, right? Uh, both the business has its own life stage, the family has, and family members have their life stage. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a complicated piece and it's very hard to get owners to, spend the time and the energy to think about it and work it through because it takes a lot of work. And I'll just finish with this, that the, probably the single biggest problem to deal with is getting the owner out <laughs> when it's time for them to get out. Uh, it's often their identity, uh, especially if you haven't figured out the financial security aspect of it, because they're not going to turn management over to somebody that's, you know, overseeing their, you know, future. Uh, but also just, you know, they still want to feel valued and give input. It, it, it's a really tough dynamic to, to sort of help the owner gracefully. Oh, it really is. Well said. Well said. <laughs> but, but also a lot of wisdom there on boundaries. Boundaries, roles, um, and how things can change over time. And that's the point. You know, how many chefs are in the kitchen? Um, mm -hmm. Which chef gets a say according to yeah, the timeline journey? Um, cool. Okay. So look, we've tapped into a few things here. One of the things I'd like to round off on is your, um, is your book, The Vibrant Workplace. Um, what's the core message of that book? So I'm, I'm a need meter. I, I, that's sort of how I grew up. I, I grew up in a family owned business and, and we would have discussions in the evenings. My dad said, well, what needs do you see that are out there need to be met? And so as I'm working with organizations and companies and leaders and we're working on appreciation, you know, change doesn't just come automatically, right? I mean, there's barriers, there's challenges. And so over time, I sort of kept track of what are the sort of common themes of the challenges to make uh, appreciation part of the culture. And so it's really built around the 10 most common obstacles that we experience in trying to help companies grow a culture of appreciation and how to get past that. So it can be anything from just a, a total lack of support from the management to pushback from supervisors, uh, busyness, negativity, perceived inauthenticity due to stupid employee recognition programs. Um, uh, people that are difficult to appreciate. Um, the, when you, the person may not be difficult to appreciate, but you just don't appreciate them. And what do you do about that? Uh, low performers, um, cross-cultural issues, um, and uh, the whole issue of just um, not understanding the value of a person and, and not, some people just not be able to get that, that it's always, it always comes back to performance and, and that that's a challenge. So that's what it's about. It, it, it's, it was a lot of fun. And it's a lot, it's a fun, but I have a cartoon in every chapter cause I like to laugh and, 
and we, we have videos that go with it. So it's a very practical follow-up to the five languages and, and it helps take things deeper for, for people and leaders that want to do it. That sounds, I like, I like the playful element of that too. That's part of my personality. Very cool. Very cool. Now, um, let me ask you a penultimate question. Um, I'm a speaker. I do my things. You know, we all kind of do our things, right? We can go out, we can do coaching workshops, we can write books, we can go on podcasts, we can do things. And we're kind of, we're all similar in the sense that we might be a speaker. Um, just out of interest, what have you found was the most pivotal, successful strategy in terms of really amplifying your message and getting it out there? Because clearly, you know, you've, you've gotten to that place now with 185,000 people taking your assessment. You know, it's, it's impressive. Like, what are some of the most successful strategies that you've employed on that journey? <laughs> well, I think this is going to be inference, right? I don't know that I have uh, the, the hard data from it, but a couple of things. One, when I've worked with f highly successful business uh, owners and I, I would interview them uh, about their life and business story and hear you know what they to what they attributed their success without exception perseverance was always mentioned and I would say that for me I mean uh, I had a marketing coach who would you know wanted us to be New York Times number one best so I said well if it happens it happens but whatever but what what has happened is you know I've just sort of go to work, do the deal, <laughs> write articles. You know, I've written over 350 articles, you know, I interviewed. And so over time that builds up. And since 2013, we've sold more books every year than the prior year. You know, we're, and we're, the average business book sells 3,000 copies in its lifetime. We're selling 1,000 a week now. And, and I think- Wow, 1,000 a week. Congratulations, yeah. that's amazing. Thank you, thanks. And, and so I, I think part of it is, just keep doing it. You know, if you do the right thing, now you have to listen to feedback and change things. But that secondly, to be honest about speaking, we have a, a, a um, criteria in and sort of a behavioral standard in our organization that every person who receives either a phone call or an email has to respond to that within 24 hours. Now they don't have to solve everything, right? But there's clearly sort of, when people are looking for speakers, it's a pain for them. <laughs> for them. And if you can make it easy, it's sort of like getting a job, right? If you can make it easy for their employer, you got, you got a leg up on that. Yes. So get back to them quickly. And then I'd say part of that is really listen. And I try to get on the call. I mean, I have people that can deal with it, but especially in certain situations, I want to find out what do you want? Who are your people? What are your goals? And listen versus uh, one thing I did learn from my market coach is people don't care what you can do. They care about how you can make their life better. All right. And so don't start with all the things you can do, yada, yada, listen and find out what their need is and see if what you can do can meet that need. And if not connect them with someone or the resource that can, it doesn't have, always have to be you, right? I mean, that's the way you build relationships and you build you know, collaboration and integrity within the marketplace. I have a lot of friends that, you know, we refer back. It's like, I can't do this. I'm not good at this, but he, he's really good at this, you know? Um, and so I think perseverance, mm -hmm. quick response, and shut up and listen, <laughs> you know, and find out what they really need and want. And sometimes you have to educate them a little bit. What they think they yes. want is not really it, but you have to start there, right? I mean, yeah. so... Uh, anyway, take it out. Uh, gold, absolute gold. All of those things you just said, they apply to not only someone that might be a speaker or a coach or the, any of these realms, that applies to building a business and a career. Um, that mm. works in sales, that works in any departmental role. Um, yeah, and these, these are the things that we can forget. Um, and yeah, just to add to the events industry part of it, yeah, I've worked in events for eight years now and um, it's the experience that your customer gets in terms of like, you know, is Dr. White available next Tuesday or not? I need to know. I've got an urgent event. Can he fly to Chicago or not? Right. You know, it matters. And that, yeah, that's how you build on things. And the other thing is building it brick by brick. I asked, um, one of the first podcasts we did was, um, with the founder of the snowboarding industry, um, Paul Graves. And I asked him, I said, how did you build it? You build a, a sport, you know, how do you do it? Brick by brick, simple mm -hmm. response, perseverance, brick by brick. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the way we all bring it together. This has been a fascinating, well-rounded, insightful, <laughs> wise conversation and, and playful. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I, I want to make sure that we give people an opportunity to find out more about you online and discover your work and get in touch with you and your team if they want to. And, and of course, read the book. Um, 
Where's the best place for people to go to to find all of this? Sort of, sort of the, the, the mothership is uh, appreciationatwork.com, and it's the word at, so appreciationatwork.com. And we have resources there about, obviously, the five languages of appreciation, our online assessment, uh, the toxic workplaces, the vibrant workplace, uh, and speaking and training opportunities. We have an online train the trainer course that we've got, I don't know, 750 people worldwide, number of trainers in Australia. Uh, right. So, um, and then, and then there's contact information from there. That's fantastic. Dr. Paul White, you have been a absolute legend today to use a great <laughs> Australian um, term. You ripper, <laughs> you legend. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on. And yeah, I will put all the links of what we, what we just said there in the description below. So thank you very much for your time today and wishing you all the success and the wonderful right. great work that you're doing. All right, my pleasure. Thanks so much.